Hello, welcome back. You have survived your first exam. You will live to tell the story. Uh, so congratulations on coming back, on being persistent. Um, I hope you've had a somewhat, I wouldn't want to say pleasant, but fine experience with your exam. By this point, you are familiar with the expectations. You know how the exam looks like. And so for that reason, I hope that from here on out, things will get slightly a tad bit easier for you because now you know what the drill is, right? Um, and so today we will resume with lectures and the topic is ahead of you. We will talk about the revolutions in Europe. Um, the most predominant one or the most impactful uh, revolution in the 18th century Europe was definitely the French Revolution, right? So this week we will study um, Europe during the so-called Age of Revolutions. And so that is to say that in the last decades of the 18th centuries, in later half of the um, 1700s, there were actually revolutions shaking both sides of the Atlantic. So this just, it's not just about one revolution changing everything, right? Because between approximately 1774-ish, 5-ish, through 1815, this entire Western world, as we know it, was actually swept by numerous political revolutions, including those in British America, so including in places that will later become America, uh, France, and also uh, the small island in the Caribbean called Haiti. And these shakeups in the system were actually a long time coming. Uh, and they, these shakeups were a result of centuries of warfare, centuries of conflict, disease, economic depression, particularly in Europe, right? And so on top of all of this, on top of all of these hardships, which we will study in greater detail in just a minute, we also have to remember that the great catalyst or the great mover or the intellectual underwriting current behind all of these revolutions, but particularly French and American revolution, was the movement we have already studied, the movement of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, as you know by now, had this emphasis on progress, on you know improving the public welfare, calling in for more just governments. But in France, that was not the case. If you remember, France produced a lot of enlightened thinkers. But when we talked about enlightened absolutism, we did not talk about French kings. So French kings, I'm sorry, uh, uh, France as a country, France as a monarchy, and French people in particular will start saying, well, we all have all of these amazing people producing amazing works of, you know, enlightenment. We are all kind of awakened by this point, but it doesn't seem that our kings are equally excited about this idea of improving the society by getting rid of some of the absolute powers that kings in France were holding up until this moment. At the same time, as we learned before the exam, there were wars in France and wars in Great Britain, or actually wars that the two fought between each other for the dominance of the um, economy in the Atlantic. And this will make or this will leave a lot of the states in Europe kind of crushed or weakened. Uh, because the states, particularly France, will be uh, facing a lot of debt and that will leave her very vulnerable to the calls for the reform. And as you already know, probably, this age of revolutions will actually not start in France. It will actually start across the pond in the North America, with the United States winning her freedom from Great Britain by 1780s. 
And following this revolution, many revolutionaries in Europe, most prominently in France, will draw inspiration from the American Revolution by the late 18th century. And so they will kind of start getting bravado or courage to uh, conjure with or come up with their own version of revolution. Now, during the American Revolution, which was only the first in a series of these revolutions of the late 18th century, Americans who formerly were these subjects of the British king, they will kind of abolish the system in which they are the monarchies and they will seek their independence from the king. You know the story, right? Um, and so Americans will publish Declaration of Independence. They will publish the Bill of Rights so that the Bill of Rights equals the first 10 amendments of the American Constitution, securing for themselves all of these enlightened ideas of religious toleration, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, um, all of these things modeled after the ideas of enlightened thinkers, but also modeled after the British Bill of Rights. And so following these revolutionary wars, America also um, abandoned the economic system of mercantilism, we've learned what that means last week, and replaced it with the system of capitalism. So this is like one of the examples in which American Revolution was actually indeed new and revolutionary. And if this were an American history class, which I uh, maybe you are you know glad it's not, but if it were, you would have listened to me for an hour, perhaps, ranting about how perhaps American Revolution was actually not that revolutionary in the first place. Because the limitations of the American Revolution, just to be, you know, mentioning some of the things very briefly, were that, for instance, American Revolution did not grant freedom to the enslaved people. It also created space for decades following uh, for the future dislocation of Native Americans. And also, of course, it will take a century and a half for women to be granted the right to vote following the American Revolution. And on top of that, what's even important for us today in terms of like comparing this to what was happening in France, it is true that during the American Revolution, Americans will actually replace one traditional system of government, meaning monarchy, um, or this system in which America was treated as a colony, and it will be replaced with the new government, meaning representative democracy or representative parliament system in which people will be voting in their representatives to represent their voices and the government, right? Um, but it's important to say here that the ways in which things were not so drastically changed in America was that in America, people, men in particular, kind of enjoyed the status of like being equal amongst each other, right? There weren't as many stark differences or drastic differences in the social structure of America. Because there was no, in America, there was no, for instance, social class of landed aristocracy. In America, there was no nobility to speak of, right? Uh, and so people... Um, in America enjoyed fair levels of social equality even before the American Revolution. But the same cannot be said about the French Revolution or honestly European society in general, in which people under monarchs, as you understand by this point, were legally still divided into separate categories or separate classes, kind of distinguishing themselves or distinguishing the church and the nobility or the church and aristocrats from literally everybody else. And so the, the non-aristocrats. And, and this persistent and in many ways unfair social division will actually be one of the root causes 
of the French Revolution. And so to explain just how deep these social divisions were in France in particular by the end of the 18th century, I've constructed this very uh, messy slash unprofessional uh, social pyramid or pyramid of social classes. Uh, and if you hear me say the word estate, this right here, first, third, and second, when I say estate, please understand that I mean social class. So when we talk about social classes in France, we are talking about estates, all right? Um, and by 1780s in France, the first and the second estate right here, top of the pyramid, the first estate was classified as clergy, and the second estate was classified as the nobility. The first two estates had a great number of legal, political, and social privileges. Among other things, they were, for instance, exempt from paying the taxes. So if you're clergy and nobility, you did not have to pay any taxes whatsoever. On top of that, they seem to have been almost as they are above the actual common law or actual words of the law. So the same laws that apply to the rest of the society actually did not apply to you if you were clergy or nobility. They were also the largest landowners. Uh, clergy in particular owned at least 10% of the land. Most of that land was very fertile, very suitable for cultivation, very much money making. And also nobility owned almost the rest of it, right? So, and, and on top of that, the nobility were the ones that were the highest paying and held the top jobs, both in the government and in the army. And these jobs were not accessible to you unless you were of royal blood. So that's pretty much unfair. So they were, they were the largest landowners possessing the majority of agricultural land, and they owned the best land, the most fertile land, while count all of this, all of these privileges, while counting for only collectively 3% of population. I'm going to, going to try not to sound too much like Bernie Sanders today in this lecture. It's going to be impossible. But the top 3% owned pretty much everything in terms of land and money and wealth and influence and privilege, but paid zero taxes in return and did not really apply. It did not really follow the law itself. On top of all of these privileges, uh, the first and the second estate also enjoyed rights such as exclusive right to hunt, also exclusive right to bear arms and swords. Um, and if you were the member of the third estate, the one on the bottom of the pyramid, things did not apply that way to you, right? So unless you were clergy and nobility, literally everybody else will be the member of the third estate. The third estate counted for over 20 million of people living in France at this point, constituting 97% of the entire population. Um, very predominant and active members of the um, third estate were the so-called bourgeoisie or these middle classes of wealthy merchants, as well as the skilled laborers. And so if, if you were, say, some sort of craftsman or artisan, or if you were, for instance, a doctor or a lawyer, you would kind of be the member of this upper middle class or middle class, and you would be called bourgeoisie. So French word for the middle wealthier class. Uh, but third estate also included people like poor peasants, or urban workers, city workers, who will constitute the vast majority of the population altogether. And so all of these different kinds of people were kind of jumbled up together in terms of rights and liberties and representation in the third estate. They carried the burden of all taxation. They were excluded from the world of privileges of first and the second estate. 
And so you can kind of see how this um, discrepancy between the three estate, not only has it always been the reality, historically reality for France, uh, but also it will create drastic economic inequality before the poor and the wealthy, which will be one of the main causes, again, of the French Revolution. So the social structure in France, the way it treated the majority of people, was one of the reasons of the greatest unhappiness for people in France by the time of the French Revolution. There are other causes of French Revolution, of course, uh, because by the end of the um, 18th century, there were other circumstances, particularly those related to economic state in France, that will eventually lead to people to rebel and go against this system. Um, and that is the fact that Europe's population altogether by 1750s, so by mid 18th century, will actually rise drastically. The towns would be swelling with people, literally. And so coupled with this rapid population growth, you also have inevitably the problem of inflation or the increase of prices of goods such as food and you know things that you know you you consider today to be as necessities and and the fall or the decrease of the purchasing uh, value of money so what that means what inflation means is you have prices of commodities are on the rise and the money or the value of the money is on decline and what this meant for people is that people had a hard time finding affordable food, finding affordable place to live, or finding affordable materials to build shelter and home. And so all of these challenges associated with the rising population and with the uh, inflation will also cause extreme difficulty for the third estate. But another cause, as if we needed more for the French Revolution, was the fact that towards the end of the 18th century, the uh, French Revolution or a French government will be in the state of debt or almost near bankruptcy. We already kind of know why that's the case, because we already know from last week that at this point in history, France is waging wars with Great Britain. Uh, they are called Second Hundred Years War, and the war that will in particular impact France, uh, it will cause further and further debt for her, as and, and it was also part of the, the series of wars against Great Britain, will be um, the Seven Years' War. And if this were American history class, we would call this war French and Indian War, okay? Now, we already also know that as a consequence of the Second, second Hundred Years' War, France will actually lose and Great Britain will win. And in this case of the Seven Years' War, uh, we will know in particular that French will lose all of their overseas possessions in North America. So this is the map of um, North America before the Seven Years' War or before the French and Indian War. And so these possessions, the, the, the territories marked in yellow on this map, this is before the war, all you see is yellow is going to be in the possession of France, but after, and, and the, the red is going to be in possession, possession of Great Britain, but after the war, we see that there's no yellow. So France will kind of lose its dominance, lose its influence, and lose its markets from which to make money in their overseas colony. So France is at this point no longer a colonial power, in North America. By the way, slight exception is this teeny tiny chunk of land. If you see, it's kind of still yellowish. Um, and that's going to be the territory of Haiti, the island of Haiti. Uh, and even that, uh, in the early 19th century, France will also lose 
um, following the Haiti Revolution, she will lose this colonial possession in the island of Haiti. And ha Haiti will kind of gain its independence from France as a consequence of Haiti Revolution. But as of right now, we see that as a consequence of Second Hundred Years War, as a consequence of Seven Years War, um, France will be faced with uh, uh, running very low in her budget, uh, and she will kind of also enter the American Revolution, American Revolutionary War, to kind of retaliate for its loss in the Seven Years' War. Um, and this will get France further and further into more and more depth. The king at the time, the king of France was Louis XVI, who, by the way, was a grandson of Louis XIV. And he was forced to finance this war effort during the uh, American Revolution with the money that he borrowed, which will, of course, put the nation that's already on the verge of bankruptcy into just more and more depth. And in fact, 50% of the entire budget of French monarchy in the late uh, 18th century was spent on the interest payments on the debt that French monarchy has already acquired even prior to American Revolutionary War. On top of that, 25% of this um, budget was spent on keeping up and maintaining the military, and 10% was spent on the upkeep um, of the Palace of Versailles and on the upkeep of the lifestyle of the royal family. When you add all of that up together, you will kind of perhaps see that not much was actually left to kind of trickle down to the third estate, to trickle down to the common people, to trickle down to majority of society, uh, to trickle down to those people who are actually financing all of this war, all of this uh, endeavor in the first place. In France, like I told you in the beginning, will actually fail to, to kind of introduce some of the social reforms introduced by the enlightened absolutists uh, in the Central Europe. Uh, and instead, because of this war debt, France, during Louis XVI, will continue to be in this perpetual state of financial crisis. Um, and its credit worthiness will be plummeting, will be on the down slide. Uh, in Louis XVI, to kind of counter all of this, he will decide to react. And what he will do is he will call this emergency meeting of the parliament called, as you know, uh, as we already know, the Estates General, and he will call it to meet to approve a new set of taxes to get countries, to get France's um, finances back into order. Now, as you know, this was a pretty drastic measure for Louis XVI to take because the Estates General had not met in almost 200 years. They had not met in 173 years because if you remember, Louis XIV has fired all of them. And so now Louis XVI says, oh, we need them again because we need more money from the people. Um, and I'm going to be inviting them back over because we clearly need some help. And so um, the Estates General was this legislative body of the representatives from all of the three estates or all of the three orders of the society. So we have the clergy, the nobility, and then everybody else to kind of come back in session by early 1789. Now, according to the rules um, kind of set in place centuries and centuries ago, each estate or each class within each three different estates generals was historically required to meet uh, and to kind of separately elect their delegates. In the distribution of the delegates inside of the each estates general is as follows. They were, they, there were 300 representatives of the first estate, the clergy, 300 representatives for the nobility, and then 600 for the third estate. Now, it's 
obvious given that only 3%, uh, that, that the first and the second estate are presenting only 3% and the third estate represents 70, I'm sorry, 97%, it's kind of obvious that the representation, when we look at the numbers, 300, 300, 600, was actually kind of numerically disproportionate. Because how can the how can an estate or a class that makes up 97% of the population have the equal amount of representatives as the first two estates combined? This isn't fair, right? The numbers don't add up uh, in terms of representation being disproportionate. On top of that, to make matters even worse and to make voting kind of more unfair or, or unjust, um, the third estate, when it came to uh, actual voting powers, um, or actually each estate, when it came to voting powers, could represent only one vote. So it wasn't like, you know, each, representatives ha each representative has one vote. No, each estate has one vote, right? So what this meant is that the first estate and the second estate could like gang up together and always overpower the voice or one vote that the, you know, the third estate had. This also meant that the two privileged classes would always outvote the third estate. And so this kind of um, unequal distribution of votes will be another reason or cause for dissatisfaction of the third estate. And so this unfairness of the French estates uh, or, you know, parliament in general, this uh, unequal voices that they represented uh, will be the driving inspiration behind um, the text you will read for this week, primary source you will read for this week. It was written by a person called Joseph Abbe Siez. And he wrote for us the text called What is the Third Estate? He was a Catholic priest. Uh, so he was actually coming from the ranks of the clergy. But sometimes even the first and second estate could kind of realize this is unfair. And this is an example of that. So he will actually claim it's unfair that nobility who represents this really teeny tiny, really overprivileged minority, that they should like be constituted as the ones who have all the say in the government. And it, he kind of claimed it kind of sucked that people with the most money in the country would also be the ones that were never obligated to pay taxes. That was unfair. To put it more nicely, he will be very harsh critic of the traditional French system of privilege, also known as the Ancien Regime. The term is here on you on the slide. An Ancien Regime is just this, um, like a fancy French word for simply meaning, quote, the old order. So Ancien Regime is this political and social system in which French monarchy is based on the rules of hereditary aristocrats absolutist monarchists in the system in which everybody was a subject to the king of France and to the clergy um, and, and kind of respected the privileges of the first two estates, but paid zero respect for everybody else. And in this primary source, he attempts to uh, answer questions regarding the status of the third estate or this position of the third estate um, in the Ancien Regime. And he will say, quote, what is third estate? It's everything. By the third estate, it's meant the collectivity of citizens who belong to common order. Anybody who holds a legal privilege of any kind leaves that common order, stands as an exception to the common law, and in consequence does not belong to the third estate. So essentially what he is saying is that he argued that common people, everybody, 
uh, who did everybody who did actually most of the hard lifting, who did most of the work uh, and paid the most taxes constituted the true essence of the nation. So it's not the nobility and clergy. They are bathing in gold. They are, you know, wasting money on all these international endeavors, fighting wars for decades, wasting our taxpayers' money. They are fighting a cause that is seemingly lost. We need to recenter back things into France. We need to reevaluate our financial situation and we need to give more rights, freedoms, and liberties to the third estate, okay? C.S. says that aristocracy and clergy are nothing but parasites because they're living off of the productive labor of peasants. They're literally sucking off life out of the third estate. Uh, and the first, he is like calling out the first and the uh, second estate to give up their power, to give up their privileges, or at the bare minimum, to at least invite each other over and to kind of talk about, like come to negotiating table, let's see what we can work out together. He will say, you can be like me. You can come from the first estate, from this world of privileges, but you can sit down and you can like reconsider, like, this is not fair. I have so much privilege. It's actually painful to watch. So he was like very aware of his privileges and he will say, he will use his position of power. He will use his voice to speak out against injustice. But his proclamation uh, was definitely not enough to make the first and the second estate give up their privileges overnight. And by this point, we have representatives of the third estate uh, kind of, you know, really angry, to put it nicely, and in order to kind of leverage their position, uh, by mid-June of 1789, they will actually say, you know what, guys, we don't like this parliament at all. And in fact, we are going to branch out and we are going to form a separate representative body called National Assembly. So National Assembly was formally uh, the first French revolutionary legislative body made up of representatives of the third estate and a few of those people in power who realized that people are drunk on their power and privilege. So some of the nobility and clergy will actually join the National Assembly, this representative body of the third estate, and they will agree or they, they at least have this awareness or believed that they should give up privileges because that's just a sensible thing to do, right? And so some of the uh, goals that the National Assembly will set for itself will be to deal with the financial crisis. And they will continue to push onto the nobility uh, to give up their privileges. And uh, they were very... Uh, radical and, and very radically uh, for France in the um, 18th century that for centuries has been a monarchy, they will want to abolish the monarchical system altogether and they wanted to introduce a better system like a representation like representative uh, government that people in America had a representative government that people in England had at this point. So they will want like the, the similar style systems that Americans and British had at this point. They will also uh, construct this image. I think we would be safe to say we can call this a political cartoon. And this was a colored engraving that was made in June of 1789 kind of representing uh, all three of the estates. So this guy on the floor is the third estate. This guy here is this first estate, the clergy. And this guy right here is the um, second estate, the nobility. And this image was printed and published as this momentum in which the third, the representatives of third estate are kind of like breaking the shackles 
that have been tying them to the ancien regime. And they're saying, we're breaking off with you guys. We are forming our own representative body. And uh, this will be like uh, them actually taking the stance or this active measure in challenging these traditional authorities during the early years of the French Revolution. All right. Now, how does Louis the Sixteenth react to all of this? Well, um, he reacts very much in the fashion of his ancestors. He was appalled, shocked, and perhaps scared of all of these things, seemingly radical things happening all at once. And so he will decide that, you know, if you guys want to meet, it's not going to happen in Versailles Palace. I'm going to close off the doors of the Versailles Palace, and I'm going to try to prevent you from meeting in the first place by pushing you out of the Versailles Palace and not letting you convene. And so what the National Assembly will do is that was, they will say, okay, whatever, we don't need your fancy palace anyways. Instead, what we will do is we are going to meet on a separate location and we are going to meet at the tennis court, all right? And so that's what they will do. Uh, so on June 20th of 1789, the National Assembly will move their um, meeting inside of the indoor tennis court. Keep in mind, this is still formally Versailles Palace, but not insides of the Versailles Palace that are typically reserved for matters of politics and matters of decision making. Uh, at the meeting, they will swear in the so-called tennis court oath. And basically with the oath, they will pledge not to dissolve or not to leave uh, until they had been recognized as legitimate representatives of the people by the king himself. And they also agreed agreed that some point um, at, at some point, somewhere along the line, they will actually construct for themselves a new constitution. And so in front of you, you also have the picture that was created um, two years after the actual tennis court meeting occurred. And if you were to look at this picture closely, you would see that we have this, uh, I guess it's a representative of the third estate and everybody else kind of is like centering their, their sight towards him. We even have some people from the outside lurking in, like wanting, wanting to check things out, see what's going on. What is this meeting about? Yes, we agree. We are excited, right? This image was kind of created to represent an idea that, or, or the symbolism that overall people are united behind this idea, right? Their force, their, their bodies are kind of centered towards uh, this one person in the middle of the room, everybody facing towards one direction, representing or symbolizing the unity of the third estate. And in fact, down here, we even have some clergy present and some, you know, people are trying to like come up and, and talk about the fact that, you know, this should be the cause of the entire nation not just of the third estate. We are all collectively standing behind the idea that the people in power should give up their traditional privileges. Now, again, how will Louis respond then to this move? Well, he kind of sort of ambivalently or with um, mixed feelings, he will attempt to uh, attempt to respond by urging all three of the estates to come and meet together again to kind of start and negotiate. But um, eventually he will also listen to the advice of the uh, of his relatives advice of advice of his advisors and court aristocrats who will urge him to actually dissolve the national assembly by force and that's exactly what he will do 
to kind of suppress uh, or to kind of prevent for them to continue the meetings that they were having, he will uh, send in military and he will send 18,000 troops of the royal army to bring these delegates under the under control like how dare they meet separately how dare they talk about freedom and liberty and equality and social justice so he will send literally military onto them and he will dismay any of the ministers who were showing even the slightest glimpse that they might be in agreement with the demands of the third estate uh, or who might be have, who might have been advising that he should that the king should listen to the third estate or what the third estate has to say, so they will all be gone and dismissed. So Louis the Sixteenth absolutely made it seem like monarchy was willing to use military force if necessary to suppress or to stop people from talking. For, to stop people from demanding more justice, to demand the share in power. So the tennis court meeting and, and the forming of the National Assembly was the action that the representatives of the third estates took. So these were the people who actually still kind of had, you know, Fairly, fair amount of power because they are still members of the legislative body, right? But if you know anything about French Revolution, you perhaps also know that it was a movement supported by regular people also. And they had no other choice because they were experiencing hardships daily. They were living through all of these demands that the third estate, that the National Assembly was going to make for them. For example, uh, in the year 1788, on top of all of the challenges they were faced with already, uh, it was uh, there was a really, really bad storm or hail storm that destroyed that year's entire harvest. And so what this will do, this will cause prices of bread and prices of grain to rise drastically, which in turn, of course, uh, made, you know, uh, uh, price of food increase uh, and also in turn kind of established the widespread hunger. And this made people of France angry because you know, well, they like to eat, they have to eat for survival. Uh, but suddenly, you know, they just couldn't afford to feed their families. And also not only that, uh, but also many of these small artisans, small traders, the bourgeoisie, the middle classes were suffering also because people no longer had money not only to afford food, but then of course, to pay for all of these services offered by the bourgeoisie. So for instance, you cannot purchase, you know, clay pots from clay masters because you are struggling to afford to buy, you know, the, the slice of bread. Also, you will not have your clothes made by tailors because you are going to prioritize purchasing food if you had any money over purchasing any other commodities if you are. If, if, if you had to, right? And so what that means is that unemployment among the middle classes, among the merchants, traders, artisans, will also be on the rise. And in Paris, 16, uh, 160,000 people lost jobs as a consequence of all of this. So people were hungry, people were angry, and they were fed up with centuries of privileges of the first two estates. And so... Of course, they will take it to the streets. And in particular, they will take it to this um, castle, we can call it, the castle uh, in Bastille or the castle of Bastille. And the Bastille was actually the old fortress that was located on the east side of Paris. Uh, and it was turned into a royal prison. So a place where, you know, people would be, be detained and taken to um, if they have been charged with serious offenses against the monarchy. And so on July 14th of 1789, 
there were about 900 of the French people uh, who will form their own army. So, and they will call it the French National Guard. And they will walk to storm the Bastille, claiming that they are supposedly marching to free all of the prisoners that were at the moment in the prison because they were, you know, put there unlawfully by the king. They were being tortured and all of those things. But what they actually were really after, what the revolutionaries storming the Bastille were actually after, uh, were the weapons that they were going to use in revolution altogether. So Bastille was used by the crown, yes, as a prison, but predominantly it was used as the storage place for all the arms and ammunition of the monarchy. And after it was successfully seized by the protesters, the Bastille had assumed, uh, uh, had, had, had this assumed status of like a very powerful symbol for revolutionary spirit in France. Um, and so the storming of Bastille was one moment, one event. Uh, but the storming of Bastille will, of course, inspire many subsequent revolts that will begin to spiral all across France. And all of these were collectively called the Great Fear. And the Great Fear were a series of seemingly sporadic rebellions that did not occur in like city centers like Paris or Lyon or Marseille, but instead they were located, they were like sporadic um, rebellions in the rural centers. So in the uh, like the, the smaller towns or villages rather. Um, so these were the riots of the peasants who were afraid that, you know, upon hearing all these news about riots in Paris, they were actually, these peasants were afraid that their landlords will start to treat them even worse because there was this fear of revolution, right? So be uh, beginning in the summer of 1789, a great number of French peasants will begin to... Uh, take the first step and they will start to protest and strike against their landlords. One of the things that they went after the most was not the lives of their landlords, but actually the feudal documents. So all the papers or all the written records displaying things like their names, the feudal contracts, or like any lists of obligations. And so for example, uh, they would burn financial accounts showing like how much work do they owe to a particular landlord. Uh, they will burn any tax records um, and they will burn this document, these documents, because they thought, well, if we burn them, then perhaps we will also, there will be no record, no track record uh, of like the work that I'm supposed to perform. So they will think, they will be thinking that if I can burn the document, I can burn this entire system of serfdom down into the ground together with it. Aside from burning feudal papers, there were also some instances in which occasionally peasants would also kill their landlords. But this was like very rare. And there were only 20 people who reportedly were killed as a result of the peasant uprising. So it was mostly destruction of property, destruction of documents that the peasants were after. And so uh, the Great Fear was this rebellion led by numerous peasants throughout the rural France in which the rural poor farmers will kind of uh, uh, fan the flames of the rebellion and pursued collectively throughout the entire country the ideas of French Revolution. So this call for the abandonment of the Ancien Regime. And perhaps it's in this background of um, chaos, if we shall call it that way, uh, that the National Assembly, which is, remember, this separate parliamentary body representing the third estate, that they will issue this document called the Declaration of, Declaration of Rights of Men. 
this is one of the primary sources also you will read for this week. Uh, and no doubt, if you are reading what kinds of proclamations that this document has made, you will perhaps notice that not only was it influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment, but it was also influenced by American Declaration of Independence, American Constitution, and subsequently also, um, I'm sorry, English Bill of Rights as well. Because the document will proclaim, among other things, that, quote, all men are born free and equal in rights. This sounds familiar to us already, right? That, quote, men have a natural right to liberty, property, and equality before the law. Also familiar. And also, men have right of religious expression and freedom from oppression, right? So all of this meant um, that as, and, and, you, and you will learn more about this document as you are reading this source for Friday, and you will see more and more, um, even more freedoms outlined in this document. Uh, and all of, all of these ideas will kind of be the piggyback of the enlightenment ideas altogether. But this document was also radical because it proclaimed something uh, unprecedented for France. The publication of this document kind of formally ended this uh, a system of privileges uh, or the system of the meritocrat or the system of meritocracy, right? So the document will say, quote, all citizens being equal in the eyes of the law are equally eligible to all dignities into all public positions and occupations according to their abilities. Abilities is an important distinction and without distinction except that of their values and their talents. So this is radical for us because we are now abandoning the system of aristocratic privileges again, and we are introducing the system based on your ability to perform and to do your job, or you are only paid as much as you are good at what you're doing. And this is called meritocracy, uh, when you kind of like summarize it all together. Uh, so this document will, that is to say, introduce new theories and ideas for the French people based on the premise of equality and erasing all of these aristocratic privileges. Um, however, when, uh, and they will also, among other things, very radically have this statement about the proclamation about the end of monarchy, because they will start claiming that the principle of, quote, the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body or individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. So this means that the sovereignty now resides with the people. The sovereignty, the power to rule, resides with the people. It does not reside with or within the office of the actual king or solely king himself. Um, all of this sounds great, right? However, when the National Assembly drafted and published the document, this document actually had very little practical effect for the poor and for the hungry people of France. And this state of economic crisis has actually worsened uh, later towards the end of 1789, when even higher and higher levels of unemployment among urban classes were also problematic. On top of that, Women who traditionally were, you know, seen as the managers of households or managers of food, uh, they could no longer, for instance, rely on, I don't know, church for help to kind of share in their charity, because following the declarations of the National Assembly, church was no longer allowed to, for instance, collect taxes from the peasants. And with that, church kind of lost its finances. It, it lost its budget and could no longer provide charity for the poor. And so because of this continuing poverty, 
three months after, um, you know, uh, after following the March on Bastille and following the proclamation of the Declaration of Rights of Men, it will actually be women who will perform their own march. In fact, in October of 1789, there will be about 7,000 women who will march to Paris. Actually, they will march to uh, Versailles and they will demand action also. They were also angry. They were not angry because they were women, but because just like everybody else, they struggled to put food on the table. And while they marched, they will have a particular target in their mind. And that target was the Queen of France, Queen Marie Antoinette, wife of Louis XVI. And they will be very um, resentful towards her extravagant lifestyle because she would flaunt her extravagant lifestyle in front of their eyes. See, Marie Antoinette, she was married to King Louis XVI when she was only 15 years old. Um, and the young couple, soon after their marriage, will come to symbolize all of the ex excess and all of the slavish spending that we traditionally associate with the French royal family. Even though the Queen's expenditure was only a small fraction, um, of the you know the the monarchical budget we said only 10 percent went for the upkeep of the lavish lifestyle of the king and the queen right but her opulence was so visible to people right she had such a luxurious taste uh and for example it's safe to say judged by the portrait right here you have on the slide on top right corner the jewelry the pearls the the dress the hair everything that was bothersome to people who were hungry also uh her wedding dress is pictured below it's so wide it's it, it's wide as a table right uh she will like have all of these diamonds and pearls embellished on her wedding dress it was kind of obvious that you know she was just trying to uh, trying to show off her privilege and her prestige um now were these diamonds that are were embellishing her dress actually a gift from her mother and they were not paid for by the french taxpayers money yes of course uh also was she the victim of very wrongly spread rumors rumors and gossip about her and about her lifestyle and adultery and scandals yes of course she was a victim of that um for example you might have heard uh a uh, few of her you know examples of speeches allegedly once when someone asked her how should we feed the people? She allegedly responded with, quote, let them eat cake, showing how little she cared about, you know, the well-being of French people. Now, this is, I'm saying this allegedly because there's actually no proof that it was actually her who said that. But all of this is to say that she was a target. She was this, uh, she was this embodiment of the royal extravagance that, you know, French king and queen were enjoying at the time. Uh, we could argue, yes, she perhaps was a victim of a circumstance, but nevertheless, to turn the story back on to women who marched to the palace of Versailles, uh, they were protesting the prices of bread, and they had Marie Antoinette as their target because to them, it's her appearance that kind of angered them, and she symbolized, again, the royal power. Also for common people, the king and queen were also seen, you know, as these bankers of last resort, uh, responsible for feeding people during the times of scarcity. And so women were mad because the royal family failed to intervene in regulating the wheat prices, in requesting for bread to be sold at the same time price per pound as it's always been. So government failed to uh, counter this soaring prices of bread. And uh, 
to to kind of like conclude this story of March of women, they will actually not reach her. Um, they will not, you know, assassinate her or even see her for that matter. Likely that was due because of the intervention of the royal army, which kind of came to the rescue of the royal family.